good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is John Heesman. I work for NGS Software in the UK. Um, if you've seen any of my other presentations over the last year, you'll know I've been focusing on uh, rootkits and specifically rootkit persistence. And today I'm going to talk about uh, EFI, which uh, is Intel's replacement for the BIOS, currently available in uh, MacBooks and likely to be available on, on most systems. Most operating systems are likely to support it uh, within the next year. So this is what I want to get through today. Um, to give you some background on EFI, I'm actually going to start by talking about a legacy BIOS. Um, so I've got quite a lot of slides to get through, so I'm going to move quickly through the, the early ones uh, where I'm going to talk about uh, what, the, what the BIOS actu uh, actually has to accomplish, uh, how we can attack a traditional BIOS, the limitations and basically the motivation for Intel developing EFI, and then we'll talk about some EFI-specific attacks and also um, the relevance of the uh, attacks against legacy biases. Then I want to talk about uh, UEFI, which is uh, the kind of successor to EFI. It's the next version that the consortium is working on. Um, I'll summarize and draw some conclusions. Firstly, I want to um, make a few uh, caveats here. Um, as I said, I'm interested in talking about rootkit persistence. I'm not really interested in what the rootkit does. So essentially, I want to uh, persist a rootkit on some device, uh, in some firmware. Um, I don't want the rootkit to be on disk. However, I do want it to be able to load automatically. So um, my rootkits have no bootstrap component on disk. They persist in firmware, and they're able to load themselves into the kernel, typically before the, 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 the operating system has finished booting up. And so I'll, I'll show you a few ways of doing that. Um, I'm not, to, not going to talk a great deal about trusted computing in this talk. Um, when we talk about UEFI, I'll, I'll mention it, but um, the EFI spec certainly doesn't mandate that you have a TPM, for example, um, and many MacBooks, um, some do have a TPM, some don't. Some of these attacks require physical access, depending on um, whether you're able to flash the firmware, um, for example, whether you need to flip a jumper. Um, and all of the attacks are likely to require root access and or kernel access. Um, and the kind of threat I see for this is a blended attack, whereby stage one is um, we, we compromise the, the user's system. Uh, we then carry out some um, information gathering to work out exactly what chipset they have. Um, and then we actually uh, go ahead and deploy our rootkit and firmware. And I'd also say that parts of this work are definitely um, very much uh, uh, work in progress. So moving on, the role of the BIOS. So the BIOS is probably one of the least understood parts of the system today. Um, we know a great deal about how, um, you, you guys know a great deal about how the bootloader works, how the operating system works. Um, but uh, the BIOS is, is uh, kind of a bit of a um, gray area. Um, so when you turn your system on, the CPU starts executing from a fixed address, and ultimately it knows pretty much nothing about the hardware in your system. It actually doesn't even know how to access RAM on your system. So one of the first things it will do is start um, issuing, um, issuing read cycles for uh, the, the, the reset vector, the, the firmware address, and those will go to the north bridge, um, which will basically direct it to the firmware device in your system. So for example, the firmware hub. Um, the first few instructions executed in, by, the, by, the, um, by the CPU will actually uh, set up the north bridge so that we can then access memory. Uh, we'll then go ahead and uh, set up the south bridge so that we can then start uh, querying devices and, and see what hardware we have in the system. Um, another key part of the BIOS is to set up um, PCI devices. Um, and in this talk, when I, talk, uh, when I mention PCI, I'm actually talking about uh, PCI, AGP, and PCI Express, because essentially the, the area I'm interested in, the expansion ROM mechanism, is common to them all. So the BIOS will scan the PCI bus and will attempt to locate um, option ROMs. Uh, option ROMs are simply x86 code that uh, is, needs to be executed in, in, uh, during the, the power on self test in order to configure the device. The BIOS also provides the uh, familiar um, setup screen, so we can configure the boot device priority and uh, 
we can persist those settings to non-volatile RAM. And finally, the BIOS will then hand off to the bootloader. So here are four ways we can attack a legacy BIOS. Here are four ways we can persist a rootkit. Firstly, we can reflash the firmware device itself. We can just reflash the BIOS. Um, I'm going to go into these in detail on the next slide, so I'll just run through them quickly now. A second attack is that we can modify um, the, the option ROMs on PCI devices themselves and, and then reflash the device. The third attack is uh, different to the first two in that um, we're not interested in modifying um, code as such. We're interested in modifying some of the data modules that are stored in the BIOS. And this attack um, modifies the advanced configuration and, and power interface tables. And then the fourth attack I want to talk about is uh, kind of different to the, to the first three in that um, though the majority of my talk is about persisting in, in firmware, this attack shows how we can persist in memory and survive across reboots without touching firmware or disk. So the first attack, patching the BIOS, um, we have a huge amount of freedom in what we can do. But uh, ultimately, the, the, the job of the BIOS is to get the bootloader going. So um, if we can subvert the bootloader, which loads the, the kernel, then we can likely de deploy our rootkit. Bootloader has to rely on a set of services exposed by the BIOS. And these are exposed through the uh, interrupt vector table. And um, you'll, you'll probably all know that uh, when we're executing the, the BIOS code, this is 16-bit real mode assembler. So if we can subvert the um, interrupt vector table, if we can hook an interrupt that um, the bootloader will rely on, then ultimately we can get our code executing in the bootloader. And then we can um, basically patch the kernel as it loads it. Um, so quite simply, um, we find the where the BIOS calls int 19 hex to pass off control to the bootloader. And before this call, the IVT has hopefully been um, constructed at this point. Um, and we can simply hook, hook the required interrupt. Um, I'll talk more about which interrupt we might go for on my next slide. Some caveats, we may require physical access, as I, I talked about. Um, and some, some vendors, Intel and Phoenix, for example, have secure flash these days, which means that we can't necessarily um, update the, uh, the firmware with an un unsigned up update. And of course, if we have a TPM in the system and it's linked into a secure boot process, for example, BitLocker on, on Vista, then um, we may not be able to um, update the firmware and get the, the machine to still boot correctly. Simply having a TPM in your machine but not using any of the secure boot process um, then we can go ahead and flash the firmware. There has, the, the TPM is simply a, um, a device to measure, uh, measure things like the, the hash of the BIOS, for example. So simply having a TPM in your machine doesn't offer you any protection. You have to have the whole um, secure boot process. The second attack is option ROMs. Um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, option ROMs are simply um, ROMs on a PCI card that hold some initialization code. Um, they can actually be for, for any, any architecture, but ultimately they're, they're likely to contain x86 code. Option ROMs are copied to RAM during the, the system post and then simply executed. So they're just blobs of x86 code that are taken straight off your card, put into memory, and executed. And they'll be stored in an EEPROM or an EEPROM, the difference being whether we have to actually remove the chip off the card to flash it. And here's an example. Um, if you have a PCI Express graphics card, it will likely have an EEPROM. Um, and the initialization code will basically install a handler for int 10 hex video. And that, that handler will imp uh, implement the VGA and the VBE functionality. So to attack uh, an option ROM, attack a PCI card, ultimately we need to dump the option ROM off the card. Alternatively, we can go to the vendor's website so, for example, if we're talking about a graphics card and you've updated the BIOS on your, your graphics card, we, you know how easy it is to, to download a tool to do it and the BIOS from the website. We patch the option ROM. Um, again, we're interested in subverting the bootloader, so we simply hook an interrupt. Um, which interrupt to hook? Well, EI released a um, proof of concept boot sector rootkit um, in 2005 and they demonstrated that if you hook in 13 hex, as in the disk interrupt, 
when the bootloader starts loading some of the um, key, key device drivers in the kernel itself, um, then essentially we can see that flow of data and we can look for a byte stream and patch it, patch it on the fly. Um, the approach I took when I was investigating putting rootkits on PCI cards was actually to hook in 10, the, the video interrupt, though this was a Windows specific technique. I noticed that uh, the, the Windows kernel actually called in 10 hex uh, during the, the boot and it's a relatively involved process because um, the Windows kernel is obviously 32-bit protective mode and these are 16-bit real mode um, interrupts. So I found that the Windows kernel actually switched the processor into V8086 mode um, and I was able to influence how it returned back to 32-bit protective mode. Um, I guess my point here is that there are likely other candidates. The, the key takeaway is that the bootloader um, in a legacy BIOS relies on services exposed by by the interrupt vector table, and if we're able to, get to execute code during, during the power on self-test, during the, the running of the BIOS, then we can simply hook one of those interrupts that it that depends upon. Pros and cons of option ROM attacks. Um, most PCI cards don't have any jumpers, so we can flash them pretty easily. Um, the flashing process itself simply is uh, doing I.O. to the card. So we just need root access in both uh, Linux, Windows, OS X, for example. We don't, um, we don't actually need to get into kernel. Um, network cards also have option ROMs, and the option ROMs on network cards implement Pixie, so the network booting. And this was a kind of nice idea that um, we could make use of their network stack so that we, uh, we could actually do things like um, pre-boot updates of our rootkit um, before the bootloader kicks in on phone home, covert, covert channels plenty of uh, opportunity. One of the disadvantages is that we're limited by space on an option ROM. We can't simply dump the code that's there because uh, your graphics card probably won't work. Um, at least it, it, um, it won't work uh, while the bootloader is, is, um, is working. By the time the kernel has, uh, by the time the operating system is loaded, uh, we no longer rely on uh, things like the, um, the int 10 handler. So the, the, the graphics card will work. But ultimately, we want to um, shoehorn our code into some slack space. And I, I played with distributing my rootkit across multiple cards, but then obviously we're uh, increasing the chances of detection or somebody removing a card and, and losing, us losing some code. And detection is fairly easy. Um, it's uh, very well documented how to dump option ROMs off the uh, PCI cards. It's um, in the PCI spec. And then we just apply some heuristics to um, uh, analyze the ROM. And if, for example, we see that it has protective mode code, and as I, as I said, we're, we're interested in, uh, we're expecting the option ROM to have real mode code, that's a giveaway. Though um, I have come up with some ways of detecting the, um, of, of subverting the detection process. As I'll, as I'll talk about later, using system management mode, it's possible to trap IO access and basically give uh, wrong results back. Okay, moving on to the third attack against a legacy BIOS, and, and as I said, many of these attacks are going to be applicable to EFI, which is why I'm going into them now. Um, this attack targets the advanced configuration and power interface, uh, which is basically a standard that replaces the advanced power management, and this handles all the power management in everything from your notebook to uh, a big server. And the way ACP works is ultimately the BIOS contains some, some data tables, and these data tables hold um, virtual instructions that are interpreted by the operating system ACP device driver. And ACP is a standard, and consequently, there's um, ACP implementations for pretty much every operating system. So um, the kind of nice thing here is that we're because we're using these virtual uh, virtual instructions, uh, we can actually make a rootkit that's um, seemingly platform independent. So the way an attack would work against ACP, um, as I said, the BIOS holds these tables containing ACP machine language. The device driver interprets these instructions. So for example, um, if you press one of the, the um, hotkeys on your um, laptop, then ultimately that will result in um, the ACP device driver interpreting some of the AML instructions that's, that tell it what to do when you press that button. And the key thing is we can um, take, take uh, the existing ACP tables for a system and we can append our own virtual instructions into these tables. And this allows us to pretty much exert full control over the system. So for example, from the ACP machine language, we can modify system memory, so we can patch the kernel. Um, we can 
uh, we have full access to the I.O. space as well. Um, so ultimately we would um, take a BIOS, crack it open into its code modules, its data modules, locate the ACPI tables, um, disassemble them into the um, ACPI source language, the high level language that they, the, the platform designers use to, to make them, modify them to put our rootkit in there, uh, recompile them, put the BIOS back together and reflash it. Benefits, as I said, the ACPI machine language is platform independent. It's these virtual instructions that are implemented by the, the um, interpreted by the device driver. And as I, as I said, the ACPI source language is a high level language, um, vaguely uh, object oriented. And it's easy to disassemble between the ACPI machine language that you find in a BIOS and the ACPI source language. Um, the ACPI device driver, um, by the time it's kicked in, obviously the, the kernel's loaded. So um, this attack allows us to um, very easily patch the kernel. And also the fact that we are, we've got this virtual machine gives us an abstraction so we can make some smart decisions and we can future-proof our rootkit. So um, at Black Hat DC in 2006, I talked about a, a, a cross-platform rootkit that had some logic that said, are we running on Windows, are we running on Linux, um, and did a, a series of tests and made absolutely sure it knew what the target was before then actually um, patching the kernel. Limitations, we need to modify the system BIOS. So um, again, if, if the, uh, if if, the, if we have to have a signed update, then, then this attack is uh, mitigated. Also, the operating system must have an ACPI device driver. Um, you can, um, basically, if we can get hold of the, the raw ACPI tables to then perform some analysis on them, then we can spot our rootkit. So if we can stop the ACPI device driver from interpreting our instructions, we can stop the rootkit deploying. And if you turn off ACPI, um, your, your system performance is likely to suffer, but your, your, your operating system will work. And finally, um, this is one thing I noted that uh, when I demonstrated this on Windows, ultimately I was getting a load of event log messages that were, that were warning me that the ACPI device driver was doing things that could uh, compromise stability because I was patching the kernel. And so ultimately um, you could come up with uh, some mitigations in the ACPI device driver that sandboxed what the interpreter was allowed to do because quite frankly um, you, you shouldn't be patching certain areas of memory. You shouldn't be patching kernel code pages, for example. Okay, um, the last attack I'll talk about on legacy biases um, is uh, warm reboot attacks. So the last three attacks require us to make modifications to firmware, which kind of makes detection easier. Um, and if we think about it, if you, if you take the case of, say, a web server or a database server, they probably have SLAs that mean that these things aren't turned off very often. Um, they might be warm rebooted, say, once a month to install some patches, but uh, the only time you might actually um, remove the power is to, uh, is to replace some hardware, for example. So it may be sufficient for us to um, try and persist in memory alone without touching disk or, or firmware. So it's pretty easy to do this because uh, what we actually find is that when the CPU, uh, when, when you first cold boot the system, those first few memory accesses that go to the firmware hub get cached in RAM for speed. And when we warm reboot, ultimately um, we'll actually just execute out of RAM. So um, basically all we need to do is modify this shadow RAM. Um, it's called shadow RAM because it's obviously shadowing the contents of the firmware device. So um, ultimately we can remove the right protection on the shadow RAM, modify it. Um, we can carry out a similar attack to, to the other attacks by um, we will look to patch the interrupt vector table. Um, and I guess the, the only unfortunate thing is there's, uh, it's kind of chipset dependent how to do this. So Intel have a concept of um, PAMs, Programmable Attribute map, Maps, and AMD has MTRRs, uh, Memory Type Range Registers. Um, but it's actually fairly easy to do this. Just download the specs, and uh, if you have some code running in, uh, well, actually I was going to say Ring Zero, but again, you, you, don't need to be, you, just need, uh, you don't need to be ring zero, you just need to be root to um, be able to remove the right protection and modify these pages. Okay, uh, moving on. So why, why do we need to replace the BIOS with a new technology? Well, the BIOS is written in 16-bit um, real mode assembler. Um, who writes that code these days? Um, not very many people. Um, and the BIOS just doesn't expose clean interfaces. An example of this is um, interrupt 15 hex, the, the so-called miscellaneous interrupt. Uh, 
and you'll find that uh, the sub-functions for this uh, interrupt just totally vary from vendor to vendor. And the few interfaces that there are defined are, are pretty clunky. For example, I'll show you uh, um, some, some, uh, some documentation from the post memory manager spec, which is a spec for if your code from, an, from another code module, for example, an option ROM, wants to allocate some memory. We have to jump through a load of hoops to actually get there. Um, we have to uh, scan for a particular four byte string. Um, then we have to check some structure to make sure we've found it. Um, and then we have some optional stability checks. Um, and then finally, we're allowed to actually call through a function pointer. So it's basically a lot of work. So one of the key, um, actually, I'll move on to it. Some of the key design principles of EFI were um, extensibility. Um, one of the other things the, the designers of EFI kept in mind is that uh, they didn't want to implement a whole new uh, host of technology. So they want to use um, existing technologies. Um, there's an EFI system partition. Um, any, any people that have a MacBook will pr probably know about that. A, uh, I believe it's about 200 megabytes, and it's just an empty partition. And it's a, a fat partition that's the, the EFI system partition that could potentially contain extra EFI modules. Um, executable images in EFI are um, basically PE files. And EFI uh, essentially doesn't mess with any of the existing interfaces that the operating system might use. So ACP and uh, SMBIOS for retrieving information about your system, both of those are there and um, by and large untouched. Um, another key design principle was uh, modularity. So the core EFI implementation is stored in firmware but the idea uh, being that, uh, and this is really the, the key idea, that uh, we can have third-party device drivers. So we have just enough to, um, just enough implementation in the firmware itself to be able to read the EFI system partition, for example, and then third parties can drop drivers in to actually um, bootstrap other hardware. You can create EFI code in uh, C, and you can compile it. You can download a development kit that. Uh, We'll let you compile it on any, any mainstream compiler. And EFI is uh, a spec. It's not an implementation. So um, it simply defines some interfaces. To solve the option ROM problem of um, option ROMs just simply containing x86 code, um, the Intel came up with a, EFI, a concept of EFI bytecode, so assen essentially their own virtual instruction set so that we can now create cards that have uh, option ROMs containing bytecode that's then interpreted by um, the EFI driver. So here's a high-level diagram of what EFI really looks like. Um, ultimately, uh, we start with the um, firmware platform initi initialization, uh, which, as I said, is, is just enough to get the thing going. And then we iteratively load drivers and you can kind of think of EFI as an op almost like an operating system in that we have the concept of drivers and we have the concept of applications. And um, eventually we end up choosing a bootloader, which is simply an EFI application. And uh, th there's plenty of um, tools out there for um, investigating the EFI environment. So, for example, um, I suspect many of you that dual boot on a Mac MacBook use something like um, Refit. Um, an R or REFIT, um, a, a basically a, a tool that will also let you drop to a shell um, and type commands as if you're at a prompt. And actually, um, Refit is, is pretty flexible and it even, have, even uses network stacks so that we can actually um, uh, connect to sites on the internet, for example. So some EFI definitions. Um, the concept of a protocol Protocol is basically an interface that exposes some functions um, contained in a driver. Um, each protocol has a GUID, which ties in with the extensibility, um, unlike the uh, interrupt 15 hex in a legacy BIOS, where vendors have just kind of uh, uh, redefined uh, sub-functions on top of each other. Um, hopefully, with a GUID, there'll, there'll be no collisions. So um, uh, everyone, each, uh, each vendor generates a GUID and, and embeds it in the driver. And the driver can implement multiple protocols. When you launch an EFI application or driver, it's passed the pointer to an EFI system table, or the sorry, the EFI system table. 
And this is a pretty key data structure um, that basically allows um, an EFI application to locate protocols and therefore um, functions within them. Um, the EFI environment is actually a protective mode, but it's a flat memory model. So we can simply pass around function pointers to things in, in other drivers or applications. Um, EFI defines boot services, and these are services that are available um, for any application or driver to use. And they, they, have, they cover the kind of handy things that you might need, for example, memory allocation, um, how to locate other protocols so that we can actually um, get stuff done, and how to actually query um, EFI images themselves so we can find out um, like uh, file paths to things, that kind of thing. We also have the concept of runtime services. And this is quite interesting in that um, these services are available after EFI has, after the environment has finished. So once the bootloader is executing, um, runtime services are still available. And the kind of idea of this is that uh, ultimately um, EFI can provide device drivers that the operating system can also use. Um, right now, um, people aren't really using this, but it's an interesting idea that uh, there could be some, you could expose some services in the EFI environment that are still available when the operating system's booted up. Um, the final definition is um, the, the framework, and this is Intel's reference implementation, and this is what's actually used by OS X. And the, the interesting thing is that it's actually partially open source. So if you're interested, go to um, tianocore.org and uh, have a look at it. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Intel views the framework as the implementation, implementation of choice if you're um, looking for an EFI implementation. So what about EFI and security? Well, um, the 1.10 spec um, isn't really focused on security. Um, the framework itself, the framework spec docs, remember that's Intel's implementation, actually starts to elaborate and says, you should have a security phase. The security phase, phase is where you um, set your core roots of trust. Um, and basically, you should make sure it's secure. Um, so the, the security phase in Intel's implementation is responsible for handling uh, restarts. As I said, it also um, serves as a root of trust. And it's responsible for handing off to the pre-EFI phase the pre-EFI phase is basically um, the phase in which the environment's brought up. So we have to get the hardware going. Um, so for example, this is where the north bridge would be configured and the south bridge would be configured. And the uh, PEI phase invokes the driver execution environment, which then means we can um, load drivers and load our applications. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like with the various phases. So how can we abuse EFI? The first objective is we need to get our code running in the EFI environment. There's a few different ways of doing this. Um, we could modify the bootloader itself. The bootloader for OSX is just simply an EFI binary on disk. We can simply patch that binary. The next stack I'm going to talk about, um, and, and I'll go through these in detail on the next few slides, is um, modifying NVRAM variables. So if you're familiar with open firmware and the way that worked, ultimately you have some uh, global variables stored in some non-volatile RAM that basically tell you um, what bootloader you want to use. Thirdly, we could uh, patch the framework itself and reflash. Uh, fourthly, we could go for an implementation flaw in one of the EFI drivers. Once we've actually got code running in the EFI environment, then how do we subvert the bootloader? We could um, hook uh, one of the runtime services or a boot, boot service that we know the bootloader will rely on. We could modify the ACP tables. As I, as I said, um, EFI basically um, doesn't really mess with them, and, and it needs to keep them there because the operating system needs them. It's an uh, existing spec. Uh, we could load a system management mode driver. And that's probably the, the most interesting attack, so I'll spend, spend time on that. Um, or we could carry out an attack that's kind of similar to attacks against the legacy BIOS if um, we know that there's a compatibility support module, bootcamp, for example. Okay, the first attack and the simplest is we modify the um, bootloader. So on OSX, that's stored at, at that path. 
Um, OS X doesn't actually use the EFI system partition. Um, but carrying out this attack is kind of unstealthy, um, simply because we could detect it pretty easily with um, anything like tripwire, unless our rootkit is aware that those, those tools are, are going to be looking for it. And if you're patching a file on disk, why don't you just patch the kernel directly instead? Um, this last point is not really applicable to OSX implementation, or, sorry, Intel's implementation of EFI, the one that OSX uses, but it will be applicable to the UEFI uh, implementations, where basically we can enforce driver signing, um, and so uh, simply uh, trying to get an unsigned um, bootloader working won't work. Modifying the non-volatile non um, RAM variables. Um, as I said, these specify which bootloader we want to use. There's an interface for us to do this from uh, EFI. Um, if you run the MVRAM tool from OSX, it lets you dump and modify um, the, the, the variables. We can create a uh, um, custom bootloader. We can set the EFI boot device and, and tell the system to, to use that. And uh, what we actually um, do in this bootloader uh, we'll typically do one of the attacks that I'm going to come on to uh, shortly, um, where we, we will shim one of the services that's available, the boot services or the runtime service, and then simply call the original bootloader. Is this stealthier than the previous one? Well, probably not, because we are modifying MVRAM, and um, if I was doing forensics on OSX, I would definitely be interested in what's in MVRAM. Code injection attacks. Um, these are going to be pretty important. When, um, uh, when people actually implement UEFI properly. Um, ultimately, we'll, we'll be looking for some kind of um, overflow, stack overflow, heap overflow, or some kind of bug um, in verifying digital signatures. And when we talk about the, the, the possibility for this, and people might ask, well, uh, what kind of user, what kind of data do we control in this environment? There's actually uh, some good targets. So uh, we could target the file system drivers, um, we could uh, malform the file system in some way um, so that we cause an overflow. Um, P passing code um, is always a good one. In my work as a security consultant uh, looking at antivirus vendors software, for example, um, the number of bugs I've found in their code relating to P passing that ultimately lead to code execution is huge. So um, I'd be really surprised that if there aren't any bugs like that. Crypto code, again, we're... we're um, obviously be verifying digital signatures on binaries, so we've got some good targets here. We can modify the data in the certs, the, the, the data itself in the certs, or we could go for ASM1 decoding. And any, any data coming off the network. So how might we actually uh, subvert the bootloader once we've got code running in EFI? Well, the spec says that when the bootloader exits, uh, sorry, when, when the bootloader is ready to transfer control to the kernel, it must notify the EFI environment by calling exit boot services. So this is a great place to hook because we know at this point that the kernel is going to be loaded. So if we hook exit boot services, um, when the bootloader actually um, calls exit boot services, we get control um, and we can patch the kernel. Um, it's fairly easy to, to actually carry out this attack. We can create a runtime driver that um, simply locates the EFI system table and replaces the, the function pointer for exit boot services. Um, I also looked at shimming runtime services, but um, not many of them are actually called. Um, by, by far, the exit boot services seem the, the best place to hook. This is what um, eLilo booting uh, Linux looks like. Um, so we see that it loads the kernel, um, frees some resources, and then calls um, boot services and then calls the, uh, sorry, exit boot services, and then it calls the um, start kernel function. So you can see that, uh, obviously, if we're, we're getting control when it calls exit boot services, it's pretty easy for us to locate the kernel in memory. Okay, this is, this is uh, probably the most interesting attack against DFI. Um, system management mode um, has been on most processes th uh, since the 386, and um, I know virtualization rootkits are getting a lot of press these days, um, but actually I think it, uh, system management mode is, is scarier than uh, virtualization, and it's been on, on most people's processes. System management mode is a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card for platform designers. 
So pretty much any time they uh, need to do something that the hardware doesn't let them, they can probably do it in system management mode. So um, basically things like the century rollover bug was fixed with, um, by, by vendors putting some code in system management mode. Um, and ultimately system management mode is very similar to virtualization in that the operating system doesn't know that, that we've gone into system management mode. So um, in the same way that um, in virtualization, the operating system shouldn't really know that a hypervisor even exists. Um, in this scenario, the operating system won't know that we've executed code in system management mode. And we can get into system management mode a number of ways. Um, ultimately, we need to get a system management interrupt fired. And these can be triggered by external events. So for example, plugging, plugging a USB device into your laptop probably generates an SMI. We can also set these up to be triggered periodically every few seconds. Um, and we can also trigger um, SMIs on IO access. So this is quite interesting. If we do um, IO access to a particular port, then we can trap that and, and uh, jump straight into system management mode. How might we abuse system management mode? Well, um, the only presentation I've seen that I actually discussed this was Luc de Flore at CanSec. And he used it for subverting BSD secure levels. And in his paper, he hinted that uh, system management mode would be pretty bad for malware. Um, why is that exactly? Well, things like hardware breakpoints just don't work in system management mode. So if we, if we had some detection software that, and we were using hardware breakpoints to, to try and detect a rootkit, then once we're in system management mode, they don't fire. The operating system cannot get access to the, um, the RAM allocated for system management mode if um, the system management, uh, the, the SMRAM config register has been set to not allow it access. So there's a lock bit that uh, some vendors set, some don't. In fact, um, uh, Luc de Flo's, uh talk basically will, um, can only concern systems where the lock bit wasn't set. Um, so, so once we've actually set that lock bit, the operating system cannot see system management RAM. SMIs can't be interrupted by anything, even non-maskable interrupts. And as I said, S SMM can also trap I.O. reads and writes, which is kind of scary. So this is a kind of uh, perfect fodder for uh, a rootkit that is seemingly undetectable. Um, I say seemingly because ultimately, um, if you're looking for it, you could probably find it, um, timing attacks, for example. Um, but why haven't we actually seen a, a SMM rootkit, considering that it's been on processes since uh, 386 SL? Well, the barrier is pretty high for entry. Um, ultimately, to debug system management mode, you need a logic analyzer. Um, so uh, it's, it's not going to be too easy to develop. And there's actually not much code out there that shows you how to, um, how to get into system management mode and what to actually do, how to write a system management mode handler. There's limited opportunity if the vendor has set the lock bit for um, malware to use it. Um, ultimately, if we compromise somebody um, and, they've, and, and the um, BIOS has set the lock bit, then we'll have to wait for the next reboot to actually, uh, we'll have to, to, to carry out the, um, one of the warm reboot attacks, for example, to then try and get a code into system management mode. And also system dependencies make it less attractive. That's to say that uh, um, you, you don't really know what your vendor is using system management uh, mode for. So you probably don't want to go blindly trashing system management RAM with your own code because you're probably likely to make something stop working. So why do I mention system management mode in the context of EFI? Well, EFI actually provides some very clean, very easy to use interfaces for system management mode. Um, they actually take all of the hard work out of um, uh, creating a system management mode driver. They provide us with a protocol for um, registering our driver, um, an access protocol whether we, so we can toggle the lock bit. Um, they provide a protocol for triggering system management interrupts, um, and the child dispatch protocol for um, setting up things like periodic callbacks. They even go further. They give us um, some functionality to use when we're in system management mode. So the SMST allows us to allocate memory um, it also gives us access to the CPU context through a nice interface. Um, so for example, the way it might work is we'll, we'll load our driver into system management mode, we'll set up a periodic interrupt, and um, 
every time our callback in system management get, uh, mode gets executed, we might want to use one of these protocols to um, examine the state of the CPU. So we have a, a context structure where we can see exactly what code was executing and we can modify things appropriately. Um, the only kind of warning about uh, the power of system management mode and, um, in, in the specs that I read basically said that you have to preserve the chain of trust that you've already set up, which is kind of a pretty vague statement. Um, if you don't have a chain of trust um, set up, then ultimately we can trivially write a driver and, and get it into system management mode, um, which is what I've able, been able to do on OS X, actually. Um, and, and if anyone's interested, I, I'll um, show them uh, just the amount of code required to do this. It's actually pretty small. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is compatibility uh, support modules. And these provide legacy compatibility. Um, so for example, you want to install an operating system on an EFI system that requires a BIOS. Um, basically, all you need to do to implement a compatibility support module, which is simply an EFI application, or, or it could be a driver, is uh, the majority of the work is uh, you need to in, uh, implement the interrupt vector table so that when the bootloader um, uh, fires an interrupt, uh, ultimately, you, uh, you can actually uh, carry out the same functionality. So most compatibility smart modules, well, the, the two I've looked at, XP on Mac and Boot Camp, will um, thunk to 32-bit protected mode. So they, they'll, they'll execute the um, bootloader in 16-bit real mode, and then when it calls the interrupt, there'll be a, a thunk into 32-bit protected mode. It will then carry out the equivalent EFI function, function and then thunk back. So really, um, if we have code execution at this point, all we need to do is hook the interrupt vector table, or we can patch the handlers. Uh, UFI. Um, UFI is basically the next version of EFI. So Intel developed EFI, and uh, version 1.10 is theirs. They then gave that to the UEFI consortium, which has all the, kind of, all the major players you'd expect in it. And they're up to version 2.1 of the spec. And they've started to um, flesh out security now. So for example, um, the, the Trusted Computing Group have also released specs to say how EFI is supposed to link in with uh, the TPM and how we can actually start um, doing a secure boot process for, for uh, EFI. Kind of, uh, I, I put this in just to um, demonstrate the point about complexity. This is what the UEFI spec says. Uh, this is how you have a PE file that you have to sign and ultimately, um, I'm sure there's going to be code, code execution bugs in, um, as I talked about, implementation flaws. So some uh, summary and conclusions here. Um, EFI is interesting. It offers a pretty large attack surface versus a, a legacy BIOS. Um, the fact that these high-level le high um, development tools are available, the fact that you just need to be able to write C code, is basically now making it a target for um, much more of a target than the original BIOS was. Um, I, I will expect that in the next few years we, we will see some attempt at malware that runs in the EFI environment. Um, the third-party driver model prevents, uh, presents an easy target. You can download the development kit and write your own EFI application or driver pretty easily. The EFI spec is pretty vague on security. It's an interface. Um, uh, but it, sorry, yeah, it's the interface, it's not the implementation. But I guess it would, I, I would have preferred to see some more um, concrete information on what they're expecting. Um, for example, the, the, the actual framework, so Intel's implementation, doesn't go into a great deal of detail about how the SEC phase should be implemented. Uh, UEFI is starting to make things a lot clearer, but I really believe there will be code injection attacks. Um, so that's pretty much as far as I've got on EFI right now. Um, if I was to say what the key kind of uh, takeaway from this talk, I think it would be that we should all be concerned about system management mode. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a, a threat that uh, we're going to see any malware, like run-of-the-mill malware that tries to get into system management mode, but it's something to keep in mind when, um, when people are talking about virtualized rootkits, I'd actually be more concerned about system management mode because that's probably on your processor, whereas virtualization, um, it's, it's obviously not on uh, all processors right now. So thanks very much.